Good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, wherever you may be. And welcome to today's Destination Insight series uh, on Cambodia with BBC and PADA. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this really, uh, you know, this is probably our sixth or seventh uh, episode in the series. Um, so it, it's great to, to actually have this. It's been a, a couple months since we've had our last Insight series and really excited to, to showcase Cambodia today. But before we begin, let me just first introduce myself. My name is Paul Brangan. I'm the Director of Communications and External Affairs at the Pacific Asia Travel Association, also known as PADA. Uh, we have uh, you know, we have some great speakers ahead of us today. We've, we begin with a fireside chat and then we'll have a, uh, some insights from BBC followed by a panel discussion. But I do have a couple of technical notes that I just wanna share with you before we get to our session. So, for those of you, many of you should already be familiar with Zoom. I, I think we've, many of us have been working from home, you know, in various different lockdowns. But for those of you who aren't, uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a toolbar, there is a chat function and a QA. and a So for the chat function, please do submit, uh, for, please do engage with other participants, uh, say hello, where you're from, how you're doing. Um, however, please don't submit any questions using this function. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A as noted in on the screen below, on the screen in front of you. Uh, please submit all your questions there. If you submit questions into the chat function, it's a bit difficult for the moderator to sort of view both at the same time. So just to keep her focused on both the panelists and the questions, use the Q&A function. For the chat, please remember to keep your chat cordial. Any, uh, any feedback you have about the insights you hear, um, but yes, please do keep it cordial. And with that, that is all of my technical notes. And now before we begin, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to now introduce the CEO of PADA to give her opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Liz Ortegara. Liz, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings. I'm Liz Ortegara. Thank you for joining the Destination Insight Series, where today we will be focusing on Cambodia, the kingdom of wonder. I'd like to thank our good friends and partners at BBC Global News and the Ministry of Tourism of Cambodia for featuring in today's webinar. Cambodia has been a valued member of the Pata Association since 1994. The Destination Insight series aims to provide an in-depth look at various destinations around the Asia Pacific region and examines how they're dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and preparing for a safe recovery and restart to travel. PATA continues to stand by its members and industry colleagues during this industry recovery. We have a number of initiatives in progress to support our members and the industry recovery. Most recently, we've initiated our advocacy for COVAX and UNICEF and their drive for vaccine equity across Asia Pacific. In addition, PATA has made available a crisis resource center, which is available on our website, and just this week, we launched a government member forum for best practice sharing across destinations on COVID safe practices. Once again, thank you to the BBC and the Ministry of Tourism of Cambodia for featuring in today's webinar. Thank you to our speakers and for, to all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Liz. And let me just put this back up. And now some have heard the opening remarks from Pata CEO Liz Ortegara, and now we've come to the first part of the session, the fireside chat with BBC. And once again, joining us for the Destination Insight series is our good friend at BBC's The Travel Show. She's a presenter there. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Carmen Roberts. Carmen? Thanks very much, Paul. Great to be here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, well, first up, we've got a, a fireside chat with um, his Excellency uh, Ratha Saktong, uh, Direct Gen Director General of Tourism Development and International Cooperation at the Ministry of Tourism in Cambodia. Uh, welcome. Um, if, if you'd like to turn on your, um, your camera. Oh yes, hello. Welcome, welcome. How, how is everything going in, uh, in Cambodia? Maybe we can start with a, a quick recap or, or catch up of the lie of the land. So what's happening on the ground from a local perspective um, with tourism in Cambodia? 
Okay. Thank you, um, Carmen, for a quick introduction of yourself and also my sincere high appreciations to the BBC and especially my thanks to Pata for organizing this special webinar on the Dissertation Insight Series. Uh, before we go in forward, let's go backward. Okay. So as, as you know, um, 2019, as we, we so call it, our industry is the pinnacle of our world. So the world enjoy a 1.4 billion international rival. And then accidentally or coincidentally, the uh, COVID-19 has occurred. So therefore the number has been dropped. But in 2019, Cambodia actually also received a 6.6 international, 6.6 uh, .6 million international rival, but also uh, an increase of 6% on year to year. And in 2020, we received a 1.3 million international arrival because of the COVID. So without the COVID, we are predicted to receive a 7 million international arrival uh, last year. So this is, as you can see, this is a heavy hit for our, our industry, especially to the Cambodian government as well in terms of the international arrival with a decrease of 80%. And the first six months of this year, uh, 2021, we actually received 150,000 international arrival. Uh, as you know, um, tourism in Cambodia actually very important. It's vital to our um, country economy and GDP. It's contributed about 12% to the whole um, country uh, GDP. And within this, we, we have forecasted to be able to get that 7 million in 2020. We have predicted another five years ahead of us that we'll be able to get uh, this number back. And also with uh, a, a additional uh, 11 million domestic uh, uh, travelers. As of the what's going on inside a country, as you were opening in the beginning, as of August uh, 5th uh, today, uh, the COVID infected patient number are at 80,225. Uh, and the recovery uh, patients are 73,421. And the death total right now is at 1,507. Um, we also uh, look at the vaccination rollout uh, campaign nationwide across the country. That's actually very important to our region. Uh, so the first dose has been administrated to our general population with 7.7 .7 million. And the second doses is at 5.2 uh, uh, million doses. And since August the 1st, uh, Monday, this Monday, uh, the Cambodian government has started to vaccinate it, um, the citizen the age between 12 to, 15, uh, 12 to 17. And they have been administrated um, about 163,113 individuals who have been uh, fully uh, receiving the first doses. And we are campaigning heavily on the 3C, uh, which is uh, uh, a way or avoiding uh, the closed uh, space, a crowded space, and also the close uh, contact. We also uh, campaign it uh, uh, to our uh, tourism professions in terms of the three prevention, which is wear masks, qualifying shields, uh, social distancing, and most importantly, wash your hands. Uh, in, in the national level, we are campaigning as a three don'ts and three prevention um, campaign. The MOT, the Ministry of Tourism, has also uh, fully introduced uh, the new normal protocol and a tourist safety measure, uh, as well as the hygiene in the tourism industry. So as you can see, we are uh, promoting this to or campaigning this to the hotelers, the restauranters, the community-based uh, tourism, uh, golf tourism, and uh, the young professions, and especially in the field of tourism. So as of the, uh, the government incentive uh, policy to stimulate uh, uh, this severe heavy hit by the COVID-19, uh, the government has actually enrolled 11 rounds of the national stimulus package to those who are uh, vulnerable hits in the, in the industry, especially who are registered and also uh, approved by the MOT, the Ministry of Tourism, and also registered with the Ministry of Economic and Finance. And the Ministry of Tourism also give out free license renewable in tourism until 2021 at the end of this year. And the online training are in full session uh, to reskill, upskill, and also for those who actually fully register under the government uh, watch in terms of the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Economic and Finance. Uh, we are grateful for the support from the uh, Cambodian Royal Government to support and adapt 
uh, the root of the roadmap of recovery 2021-2025, which was presented uh, to the uh, to uh, to the prime uh, to the uh, the government of Cambodia uh, by the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, so this initiative roadmap is covered five years. It's 2021 and 2025 recovery roadmap. So we focus on three main area. Uh, first is the, the year of the resilient, which is this year, 2021, and 2022 and 2023, which is the recovery mode, and 2024 and 25, which is the restart and relaunch of our tourism industry. Uh, keep it in mind also, uh, the, another major uh, uh, thing, significant uh, uh, thing that happened in the recent month in Cambodia that not many people in the region has noticed is that we also develop a tourism master plan for Siem Reap. And as you know, Siem Reap is UNESCO heritage sites, its culture, its heritage. But at the same time, we have a vision to develop in, in, uh, into a, a, a world high-class tourism destination. So with this uh, tourism uh, development master plan, it will cover uh, from 2021 and 2035. And the government also support uh, the, uh, the master plan of tourism development in the northern, the northeastern part of Cambodia, which is Mundukiri. So Mundukiri actually is a is a last frontier of Cambodian uh, paradise of ecotourism. So this is what we are uh, predominantly focusing on. Uh, even though the COVID have uh, uh, take course, but we we actually uh, use this as a, as an opportunity uh, to actually uh, try to rejuvenate and also our sector in the country to be more a little bit more productive and then be ready. Uh, when the uh, things are settled down and the borders are open, and we we be most likely ready to welcome all the international uh, tourists uh, when uh, this is settled. Thank you. Well, that's that's great. That um, I have noticed that the Cambodian vaccination numbers are very very high, um, second in Asia to Singapore, um, which which must be very uh, reassuring for for everyone on the ground. Are you getting that sense from people ar around Asia as well that, um, you know, that people are more receptive to perhaps coming back? Because I don't, your borders haven't actually closed, have they? Well, since the pandemic took place, the border never been shut. Actually, it's been open, but only um, has to fulfill within a certain criteria. Uh, like for example, we are opening to the diplomat courts. We are, we all, we are opening to a business investor. We are opening into a special permissions who actually a consultants, a uh, for example, uh, Chaika, uh, whoever, uh, and then the DOA who actually work from the overseas and, and that has returned or have a work and obligations to fulfill uh, into uh, the Kingdom of Cambodia. However, all the safety uh, protocol have to be fulfilled and also apply. Uh, the 14 day state quarantine has to be applied. Um, the PCR test has to be applied. Uh, so on and so forth. But so far, like I mentioned, the number is 150,000, you know, in, in, in the first six months. We didn't expect this to get that much of a number. But at the same time, we are, we are grateful for this, despite, you know, um, the, the aviation industry has actually, in my definition, has been collapsed completely. So yeah. uh, we, we, we actually uh, see some of the number of people who are actually arriving to Cambodia by air. Uh, but at the same time, um, thankful to the Ministry of Health and the Royal Cambodian Government of Cambodia actually manage uh, this outbreak uh, effectively. Okay, and it's interesting you've got a recovery roadmap that is so extensive that extends to 2025. So what are the initial steps? I guess what everyone wants to know is when can we come to Cambodia? So when, when will it start opening up? When will you start accepting, um, you know, general tourists, um, not business people with vested interests, so to speak. So I, vacation tourists. Thank you for that question. Actually, a lot of people say it's a million dollar question. I say it's a billion dollar question because this is, a, as I mean, all the view out there, this is actually very important to our region. So um, as you know, uh, the region, uh, some of our neighboring country have a, a certain policy of reopening and then shut down. And then due to, um, despite of this uh, new variants of the COVID-19 or whatnot, but at the same time, we are trying very hard to work with our SOP at the standard operating procedure. So this is when this is in place and it has been approved by at the committee of fighting against the COVID-19, we are chaired by our prime minister, some like Captain Hassan Anthony Hun Sain. So therefore we can move forward with this, but at the same time, 
we are looking at the light of uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully a quarter four of this year. So you're looking for probably like another five months. And keeping in mind that the government of Cambodia just approved for the Ministry of Tourism to host uh, the ATF, the ASEAN Tourism Forums, that will be held in Presidio uh, City uh, from January 16th to, to the 22nd under the theme, the ASEAN, the shared, uh, the shared uh, ASEAN, the community peace and shared future towards the uh, tourism recovery uh, for our region. So how will, um, at, you say in the fourth quarter of this year, how will Cambodia start to reopen? Will you have travel bubbles? Will there be corridors? Are you going to have a test destination like they have had, we've seen with Phuket, with the Phuket sandbox? Are you watching that with interest? Uh, for, for, for this, I think the, the essence and, and the key to this uh, success, I think is the vaccination. Um, as, as, as you know, today, as we speak, vaccination is a new currency, is a new trust. And it has to start with domestic tourism because not, no international arrival will come to your own country, your own backyard, if your door is not open and your people are, are not traveling and your own people are not servicing to, to the international tourists. So I think uh, if we are pushing the strain, we will complete the vaccination rollout um, campaign, uh, hopefully at the end of September, then we can see uh, some of the number, actually you, when you flatten the curve, when you see the number going down, then there's another trust and confidence from the region, especially from our neighboring country. And at the same time, uh, we the, the definition of travel bubble has been around for quite some time. I mean, at first we hear about it is something new, but at the same time, it's been carrying um, this definition for almost two years already. So I think we're not looking at travel bubble, we're not looking at travel corridor, but at the same time, we will apply on SOP. So we, would, we, we wouldn't say it's Phuket Senbat, we wouldn't say it's Chao Cuerdo, but if our SOP are actually uh, up to notch and then actually really uh, standardize and, and, and uh, get approved from the government and very really precise guideline, I think we'll attract a lot of tourists in the long haul as well. Um, you mentioned, I guess, the ASEAN Tourism Forum um, happening in January, 2022. That's six months away. Um, we've, we've got a Q&A here. Someone has asked, is it really going to happen? Will it happen in person? And if not, will it be a hybrid event? Will there be um, potential to have it online? We have contingency. We are doing it as a hybrid format. So some of the meeting, high level meeting will be physical, but very limited. Uh, like again, I'm going to mention SOP a lot because this, this is going to be a new thing for us. And then, uh, but uh, the, the most important is the traffic because it's the largest exhibition platform annually that will happen in the beginning of the physical year in Southeast Asia. So we try to, uh, and, and, and you know, we have the, uh, the head NTO, you have the minister, the ASEAN minister uh, meeting with a plus three with uh, India and also with first time it will be also the ASEAN tourism minister with, with Russia. And then um, with the, uh, our dialogue partner, external and, and internal partner. So we hope to organize this successfully, but at the same time, we have to limit uh, the restriction. And at the same time, we have to uh, try to uh, gather our resources and see uh, what kind of uh, uh, ATF are we going to highlight this year. And plus, you know, we are grateful and thankful for Indonesia for supporting Cambodia in the past year or so to carry our flagship. And we don't want to uh, carry this flagship um, much longer. So we want to finish it and then we, we, we can actually uh, move on with it. And hopefully uh, within our roadmap, this is our, our, our initiative to restart the tourism within our region. And um, so once, getting back to the earlier question, once you start getting the, the herd vaccination, um, at the end of September, what will be the plan? Will, will you focus on certain destinations, like for instance, Siem Reap or um, Sihanoukville, for instance, or Phnom Penh? What will be the government's um, tourism focus? That, that's a, a very great question. All three major destinations you mentioned have an international airport. So that's key, that's our gateway. And, and another very important thing is two of the destination actually as well, um, it's right now, it's work in progress in terms of um, investment and also development. I, I'm, I'm not sure if you have seen Sinoville or Brasino province in the past 18 months. Uh, it's, it's a transcend, it's a, it's a beautiful thing that, I mean, I was born here 
at its, its, its Cambodian pride. I mean, we developed we developed it within a year and a half, and it's a it's it's like a Cinderella story that you know it it just rises up from the ashes. So it's 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 a uh, it's new development, new infrastructure. The airport actually the runway has added additional 100 uh, 850 uh, meter length uh, to the runway, and uh, the government put significant amount of investment into uh, into this infrastructure. That's why uh, we we would like to host the ATF in Cineville. And also, it's the first time to host the ATF and such as the exhibition in a coastal area of Cambodia. And not to mention that we also a full member of the most a beautiful Bay Club in the world organization. So, and, and this is uh, it's, it's one of the initiative. And then on the other hand, is in in in, in Siem Reap. Since the number has been dropped, uh, there's not a lot of tourists, so it's a good opportunity for the Royal Cambodian government to actually uh, rebuild infrastructure. So for those of you who has been to Siem Reap in the past three years, if you want to revisit, the whole structure will change. Not, not to impact the UNESCO protected site, but within the surrounding area, you got more road, you got more uh, access to, to the river, you got access to more sites than before. And uh, uh, for, 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 for the question, how are we gonna reopen it? The three, the three main destinations will be open it in time. But at the same time, we we'll try to reopen it. Uh, first, it's start with the coastal, and then Phnom Penh, and then it's going to be in uh, Siem Reap, as long uh, as long as the vaccination policy rollout will be complete. Okay, so it all hinges on that vaccination policy rollout. Correct. Well, you're doing well so far, so it bodes well for the coming months ahead. Um, thank you so much for your time. It was it was so interesting to hear, and I hope I can get to Cambodia someday soon. So I'm I'm really hoping. It all, all goes very smoothly in the coming months. Thank you very you much. Come to the ATF. Everyone is invited. <laughs> I might just do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's thank come Carmen. back to all and thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you very much, Excellency Ratasak. Uh, I do hope to see you in, in January of next year at, at ATF. It's been a while since we've, uh, we've caught up, but uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know you're a busy man. So it, it's been a pleasure having you, and uh, I'll let you go back to your to your uh, to the rest of uh, your day. To either you can stay and watch the, the rest of it, or you can, if you have urgent business, you can feel free to uh, to take care of that. But you guys can all turn off your cameras now, and I will go to the next session. Thank you. Thanks. So you've heard a little bit from, from the Ministry of Tourism of Cambodia, and we're just gonna shift gears slightly and hear from our good friends at BBC to give us a little bit of insights on Cambodia from their perspective. And with that, joining us is the Vice President of Advertising Sales, Singapore and Southeast Asia at BBC Global News Limited, our good friend, Mr. John Williams. Hi, John. Hi, thank you, Paul. And uh, yeah, just like to echo um, the really interesting information there from uh, His Excellency Thong Wekasak about Cambodia. Uh, I'll definitely be coming to ATF uh, if I'm allowed to leave Singapore next year. I'm looking forward to it very, very much indeed. Look, before we move on to the, um, uh, obviously on to the, the far side chat, um, there are just a couple of slides, um, if possible, that I'd like to run through you, really just because uh, travel and tourism is such a, a key and integral part of the BBC's business. We obviously are very interested in in insights about what's going on, especially in the time of, of COVID. And what we've got here is a couple of slides, really just about travel insights, um, about travel in general, uh, our audience, and then specifically about, about Cambodia. And then there's a small opportunity at the end, but I promise not too much sales. So Paul, uh, Paul is driving this. So Paul, onto the next slide, if and when you can. So uh, very simply, um, uh, what you can see here um, is that um, our research shows that you know, even though the COVID-19 pandemic ha has really brought travel uh, to a standstill, uh, and I think everybody on this call probably knows that, um, you know, people are still very eager to start traveling and very eager to start traveling once the pandemic is over. And in fact, our research has shown that nearly one in two or 50% of frequent travelers are looking to travel as soon as they possibly can once the pandemic is over. I guess the big question is, when is the pandemic deemed to be over. In fact, only a small percentage of people, about one in six or 18 percent, um, don't see themselves uh, traveling in the foreseeable future, be the fact that for leisure or, or for business, um, whereas most people are very keen to get back on the road. Um, 
With that as well, also, when asked about their thoughts on international versus local travel, now, you know, the BBC's audience by and large is, is comprised of um, many people who, who uh, travel a great deal for work and also for leisure. Uh, international travel is still very, very key. International holidays abroad are as popular as local trips for frequent travellers. So, you know, once people are thinking about where they want to go, they're still dreaming very much about destinations overseas. And one of those is undoubtedly Cambodia, as we'll touch on a little bit later. Paul? To understand a little bit about our, our travellers' preferences or the BBC's audience travel preferences when it comes to making uh, what we deem to be post-pandemic holiday plans, uh, we asked them really just to rank some of the elements that would be really important to them uh, to, as and when they book their travel, specifically their leisure travel. And as you can see, interestingly enough, the things that have always driven international travel hasn't really changed. It's still people are very keen to, to travel overseas to, to experience history and the heritage that those markets develop to them, especially places like Cambodia, which obviously has such a rich and unique history. Um, peace and tranquility, despite the fact that people are, uh, a lot of people are still working from home or haven't had the, um, haven't had to be going into the office for work. Um, you know, the, the change of scenery and perhaps a change of, uh, a change of outcome um, is what people are very much looking for. So peace and tranquility is a big driver to international level leisure travel. Um, it doesn't go away, but obviously cost, is something that also is, is a great interest. And I think what would be interesting post-pandemic post is to see um, what sort of prices are gonna be on offer because the age, I suspect, of cheap travel and um, that we all so much enjoyed um, specifically up to the year of 2019, as His Excellency Rekhafak was talking about and those record um, numbers of individuals coming to Cambodia, I'd imagine that uh, come 2022 and 2023, uh, prices, not necessarily in Cambodia, but certainly are traveling to those markets uh, may well um, be more uh, onerous than they were in 2019. And the last thing I think is, is something that's been, been trending for some time is that, you know, we know that our audience are looking for what we deal, what we, I guess we would, we would, you know, contain it as an authentic cultural experience. Um, you know, people nowadays are pretty well traveled. And I think that they know very much when they travel overseas, when they're getting an authentic cultural experience. Obviously there's, you know, fly and flop is one thing. Uh, and people obviously want to go and relax when they're away, but they also want to be able to take something back that is unique to them and perhaps to that destination. So for all of you who are in the businesses, I'm sure you're probably much aware, authentic cultural experiences, be that from the airline through to the destination, through to wherever you're staying, is a real key driver for the BBC audience when they're looking to travel overseas. Um, Quite interestingly, uh, the BBC audience um, is is very broad in its in its uh, in its interests, and things like um, history, culture, and archaeology reflect the our audience's interest broader travel themes. So on BBC Travel, which is our travel website, um, content that we write about these sorts of things and obviously reflecting the destinations our audiences travel to, uh, perform really really well. So we actually look at what our audience like to read and what they like to uh, know more about. And so we make sure that we basically feed that to them. And this is of importance to potential advertisers who work with us, because if they're looking to reach and engage with our audience, we want to be telling them about the cultural and the archaeological, archaeological and the historical um, attractions in their markets in order to basically get these people to travel to those destinations. Paul, if you just want to click on the next one, food. Um, you know, uh, one of the beauties of being in Asia is the wonderful diversity of food and cuisine that this region um, offers in such really a small demographic uh, footprint. And food is a, is a massively popular trend for the BBC's audience. And we always say to potential advertisers who work with us, specifically in the travel and tourism sphere, you know, you want to basically be talking about food. Um, I think as people have been um, locked down, um, and you saw, obviously, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge interest in baking and everybody who was anybody who was making sourdough. Unfortunately, that's come to an end now. But, you know, food and, and internet and food from other markets, this is a great interest um, to our audience. With countries in lockdown, I think just people spent a lot more time at home honing their culinary skills and dreaming of other foods that they'd like to sample and taste. Um, beside browsing the internet for more food ideas, um, as I said, our audience love to read about speciality foods in other countries. So, again, you know, um, places like Cambodia, which have such distinct and original and emerging um, international food um, uh, trends, um, are certainly places that I know our audience are very keen to travel to. And we know that our audience is interested in reading more and more about food. Uh, who doesn't like to talk about food? We'll take it. 
a little bit about our audience, um, if I may. Um, look, 52% of our audience, uh, nearly half, um, are interested in traveling. And that's even during the pandemic. So as I said, even though they physically may not be able to travel, they are dreaming. And many of them are planning about what they're going to be doing. I'm sure a lot of them have been planning and booking tickets and just rolling them back as airlines and hotels have been offering that level of flexibility. Um, you know, our Asia Pack audience travel a lot within the region. Um, they travel a lot greatly in Southeast Asia. Um, I think there's a belief that Southeast Asian audiences are looking also to travel to Europe and the US. That certainly isn't true um, with our audience. They are very keen to travel within Southeast Asia because I think that they understand that there is huge diversity and cultural difference in the region. Um, and they're one, time, one and a half times as likely to do so, or more likely to do so, should I say, as compared to the affluent, average affluent population in Southeast Asia. And um, lastly, um, a lot of our audience take a lot of international trips annually. They are 40% more likely to do so. 70% take at least six international trips annually. That's a combination of business and leisure, or that dreadful word, pleasure, where people go on business and extend it into leisure. Um, but the most important thing, I guess, to take away is that, you know, the people who love the BBC in the region love to travel abroad. If we just briefly look at Cambodia specifically, um, we know that our audience uh, in, in APAC um, have visited Cambodia before. And in fact, they're one and a half times more likely than average to have visited Cambodia before. And therefore, they're actually more than likely to visit again. And as someone who's had the pleasure of going to Cambodia, a few times for both for business and for pleasure. You know that once bitten, um, twice shy, you just want to get back there. Um, and that is reflected in our audience as well. They know that Cambodia for them is seen as a, a market that is still emerging and developing and holds a sort of mystique that perhaps some other markets uh, in the region don't. Um, also, we know that nearly 50% of our audience who have been to Cambodia also traveled around Southeast Asia. So they see Asia uh, very much as their playground. Uh, and they want to keep traveling. So, you know, the more information there is about destinations opening up and the likelihood of that happening, the better. Um, just briefly, uh, the audience that we have spend quite a lot of money when they're traveling overseas. Um, when they've been going to Cambodia, they've been spending on average about $7,000. Most of that goes in upmarket hotels and resorts. And 33% uh, of our audience said they have expensive tastes and spend freely when on holiday. But who doesn't have expensive tastes and who doesn't spend freely when on holiday? Because when you spend on holiday, it doesn't feel like you're really spending money, as we all know. I think the thing to take out of this is that our audience, when they travel to Cambodia, uh, are good for Cambodia because the money that they spend, they spend a lot. And that money goes into Cambodian or into Cambodian um, destinations and services. Um, a little bit about BBC Travel. So, look, um, we have a website, bbc.com slash travel, which is the home of our our travel news and information and our mantra is uh, to explore somewhere new every day uh, hosted by our editor who sits in new york but with a team of editors globally um, bbc travel is a fantastic um, website uh, updated fresh and now on what's known as um, progressive web um, uh, progressive web analysis uh, platform it's amazing it delivers about 3.3 million uniques a month uh, with about 5.6 million page views so not huge but what it is, is actually very dedicated. People who use BBC Travel uh, love it. And they have an average length per visit of five and a half minutes, which is quite engaging considering this is content that they're reading through uh, of their busy day. Um, also, a lot of people use uh, BBC Travel on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and of course, Twitter. And a little bit about our audience profile on BBC Travel. As you'd expect, you know, um, they visit the site very regularly. Um, they are 9% uh, are under the age of 35, so quite young. Um, they're very wealthy, or they seem to be very particularly wealthy. A lot of them are business decision makers. So the fact that they're interested in travel doesn't mean they're not business people. They are, but they see BBC Travel as, for them, uh, one of their key points of interest. Uh, they're senior, they travel a great deal, and they're 95% more likely to return to the website because they find it extremely satisfying. And also, they like to discuss what they find on the website. So we know that BBC Travel really works for them. So a quick thing, um, look, why advertise now? Um, if you're wondering if it's a good time to be advertising in the middle of a global pandemic, um, in fact, um, some research that we've had shows it's actually a really good time to be engaging with your audience and your customers. And, and, and the research really shows it, it's quite obvious, actually. Um, our audience find that 67% of the BBC's APAC audiences have preferred brands to continue communicating with them normally during the pandemic. They want that sense of normalcy and they want to know what's going on. 
And that's really important for brands, for, for consumer brands, future travel tours and destinations, airlines and hotels and what have you. Um, you know, life hasn't stopped and people still need to know what's going on and they want to be dreaming and planning. So, you know, those brands have continued to advertise, not just with the BBC, but with our competitors as well. We believe we'll come out of this uh, stronger. Um, and our audience also believe that it's important that brands keep supporting publishers or outlets uh, by advertising. Um, you know, we do provide a service to them. And I think in times of um, great uncertainty and disruption, such as now, um, it's interesting or it's important that the platforms, certainly trusted platforms like the BBC and also some of our more um, prestigious competitors uh, are supported at this time. And lastly, um, it says here that 58% of the BBC's audience agree that brands that continue to advertise will see positive sales benefits once the pandemic ends or comes to or stabilizes. That really, that's an old marketing maxim that you know, when, when times are tough, it's those brands that actually uh, continue to advertise, be that uh, in any way, shape or form, doesn't have to be above the line, can be below the line. You may have to switch their marketing strategy from TV to digital or to, uh, or to, or to many other different formats. Those that are seen to be in the market will most quickly benefit uh, once the market picks up again because they have gained share of voice, share of mind and eventually share, share of wallet. Paul, what's next? So look, some key takeaways for us very simply is that you know, frequent travelers are looking to resume travel, uh, both locally and internationally. Um, our travelers are 150% as likely to travel to Cambodia as the average, and 58% of our audience agree that brands that continue to advertise will see positive sales benefits once the pandemic ends and or stabilizes, which is all really good positive news. But, um, you know, uh, there are some things, obviously, that we still need to take into account. And on the next slide, I've been very cheeky and I've actually stolen from Parta and themselves. So if you just click on the next slide, Parta themselves did some research, uh, the impact of health and hygiene on post-COVID-19 destinations capabilities. And I think this was really, really key. And this is obviously something that uh, His Excellency referred to earlier, which is that whilst people want to travel and they're dreaming of traveling, there are definitely uh, blockers um, to that happening. And you know how destinations manage their COVID nineteen affects travelers' decision makings. Just sorry, travelers' decision making. Um, you know, seventy one percent of people surveyed are concerned with how destinations contain the number of COVID infections and fatalities. So that actually does impact on what people think. So somewhere like Cambodia, that has a really strong story to talk about the way it's addressing and dealing with uh, COVID and its level of. Um, uh, the, the level of, uh, of, of injections it's been taking or it's undertaking uh, is, is very strong because it basically put, positions Cambodia well in the minds of potential future travellers. 72% um, of people um, uh, researched, uh, agreed or are watching destination social responsibility towards preventing the spread of virus. I, you know, their three C's or their three rules um, that Cambodia has put into place is really key because it's actually showing that the country itself is being very proactive uh, socially uh, in dealing with COVID. Um, and also looking at businesses, how are businesses dealing uh, with COVID and the effects of COVID? 72% are paying attention to businesses that have measures in place to prevent the spread of viruses. So, you know, just slightly going off piece here and looking at someone like the Maldives that have been very aggressive in making their business talk about the way that they are uh, preparing themselves and the, and the protocols they have in place for, for arrivals has actually benefited them particularly well. And then lastly, you know, safe distancing, and it's something that uh, His Excellency talked about earlier with the three Cs about contact, safe distancing is deemed a priority. So we know full well that our audience are interested in traveling overseas, but we also know they're interested in traveling to places that are slightly more remote and basically allow for people to have a certain sense of distance. So we wonder whether or not we'll see the days of mass uh, tourism uh, in the old uh, way coming back to the fore. Um, we see that uh, you know, safe distancing is obviously a priority for audiences overseas. Uh, Paul, uh, look, with that in mind, and I thought, oh, Damien, let's get this. And, and actually, with that in mind, and with the, um, the whole message about safe distancing and being informed, the BBC is itself launching a brand new product called um, uh, Explore New World. Um, Explore New World um, is a, an online travel tool, actually, that works with BBC Travel, and it works in conjunction with, with IATA. And what it does is it marries IATA's data about places that you can travel to safely from wherever you live in the world. So, for example, if you live in Mauritius and you wish to travel to Asia, you can search where in Asia uh, you are able to travel to. Uh, green lines or green highlights here will show that you can travel to Japan, etc., etc. Uh, red lines mean that you can't. 
BBC provides a whole range of editorial content. IATA provides all the real-time data. And this is something that's actually new to us and actually we think will be of great value to audiences and also tra travel and tourism advertisers who are looking to influence or basically drive uh, attendees to their destinations. Because obviously the beauty of this is that the information is real and fresh and third party. Um, look, that's, that's yet to launch. Um, we're looking for a launch partner for that uh, later this year. If that's something that you're interested in talking to me about, please do. That is enough of the sales pitch from me. Um, the last slide is just me, uh, just my um, contact details. Paul's going to end that. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. I'm going to hand back to Paul and Carmen uh, for the first side chat. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the session, Paul. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and that wasn't too cheeky. I liked I liked our pot of slide. It was uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> that that report that report that John referenced is available on our at our website. It is a uh, free publication for all. Uh, just go to www.pata.org. Uh, just search Pata catalogs. You can actually just download the full report and get those insights yourself. Um, and uh, but yes, thank you very much, John. So it was a pleasure to hear from you. And with that, let me just go to our. My slides, we've come, oops, sorry, wrong slide. Here, sorry, I have a lot of things going on here. And with that, we've come to our panel discussion and we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into what's going on in Cambodia. Well, we'll hear from uh, several different stakeholders. Of course, uh, a representative from the ministry will also be here. And with that, moderating this session, Please welcome back uh, BBC pre presenter at the travel show, Ms. Carmen Roberts. Carmen. Thank you, Paul. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we've got an exciting lineup coming up next with our panel discussion. So let's get underway. Um, I'll introduce our, our first panelist, which is, which is His Excellency Tree Chiv, the Director of International Cooperation and ASEAN Department of the Ministry of Tourism in Cambodia. Um, His Excellency Tree, could you turn on your camera? So once I introduce you, please feel free to turn on your camera. Welcome. Um, and next we have uh, Claude Colombi, uh, the chairman of the board of Agapur Le Cambouge, which is in English, Act for Cambodia. Um, Claude, welcome. Thank you, Carmen. Yes, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll go into shortly um, all about Act for Cambodia. Um, and then finally, we've got Herman Kemp, the general manager of the Hyatt Regency in Phnom Penh. Uh, welcome, Herman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's start off with Claude. Um, Claude, many people might not have heard of Agapur Le Cambouge um, or Act for Cambodia. Let's, shall we, shall we now say APLC going you forward? You can say APLC, yes, that's right. <laughs> so, so tell us all about it. Um, what does the organization do? Well, Agapur Le Cambodge has created Salabai Hotel School, uh, which is an hotel and restaurant school in Siem Reap. Cambodia, of course, just six kilometers away from uh, the famous Angkor Temple. And this school uh, enabled young Cambodians aged from 17 to 23 years old, all issued from very underprivileged families, to have access to five different hospitality training, culinary, food and beverage, front office, housekeeping, and beauty therapy. So the recruitment process lasts six months and more than 400 candidates apply every year and all families are surveyed in order to assess the social level. By the way, we recruit 70% of girls by choice, more vulnerable and with less access to education. So the training program is built around theoretical and practical training, general education with soft skills development and the practical training is provided in rotation between practice at the training hotel, restaurant, and beauty therapy center, but also with two internships of two months each at one of the school 20 hotels partner nationwide with high international standards. So the student training is completed by general education through which they acquire and improve their English, math, uh, of course, digital skills. And finally, every week we have workshop uh, organized on various themes such as gender-based violence, gender equality, responsible consumption, health, environment protection, et cetera, et cetera. So once uh, they graduated, and of course, thanks to the salary trainers and social workers, the students are able to find a decent work in the hospitality industry. 
because of the high recognition of the program, the training has been certified by ASEAN in 2018. 100% of the students are able to find a job within four to six weeks following their graduation. So it's a very, very efficient program. Of course, it, it changed a little bit since the COVID-19 has arrived. And, uh, but you can say that when students get out of the school and get graduated, they can earn a salary three to four times higher than their family income. And one thing which is very interesting is more than 85% of them will, were still working in the tourism industry five years after having been graduated. So since 2002, we have trained almost 2,000 students now at the school. Wow, that's amazing. What a fantastic initiative. And, and what's the state of play now, I guess, with um, Salabai? So, yeah, well, of course, since March 2020, we have some stop and go uh, experience at the school. And, uh, and the, the, the COVID-19 has, uh, has plunged the tourist industry to an unprecedented economic crisis. Uh, so Salabai School has moved into flexibility, I should say, and agility uh, by introducing e-learning during all closing periods with all the students, including providing digital equipment for them and all the trainers. Now you have to realize that most of the students have to go back home and they need some equipment in yeah. order to connect with the teacher. So that was quite uh, uh, challenging, actually. Yes. Uh, since December 2020, we have, um, the students have been cultivating an organic garden and they are trained by the Cambodian NGO Camborea that teach them the, the principle and method of agroecology and permaculture. So we want to diversify our program and this project is of course a consequence of the pandemic. And because of the crisis in tourist industry, the school uh, want to extend student skills. This training in sustainable agriculture uh, puts you, uh, of course, all the objectives, including the access to a healthy and diverse food, the fight for environment protection and against global warming, but also the, the, the use of short and supply channels. It's very important for the students as well. Uh, for the next intake, which hopefully will start, I hope, in September, uh, we have decided to download the amount of students for, from 150 students, which we used to train every year to 100, but to extend the curriculum up to two years instead of one. We expect 2023 will facilitate them to find a job in a, let's say, a re revitalized hospitality industry. And during the second year, six months will be dedicated into an entrepreneurial courses to allow some of them to create their own business once graduated. So this is a very new challenge for us, uh, very exciting actually. Um, and of course, uh, last but not least, taking care of uh, our previous intake alumni, which were severely impacted during their first work experience is part of our mission. So we have launched an emergency relief plan and deployed last year and we continue to do for most of them. So to be honest, we, we strongly believe that tourism industry will deeply restart soon in Southeast Asia and employment opportunities uh, will remain at, again, at a high level, either in terms of number, but also in terms of uh, savoir-faire, know-how. I think it's very important. And that's been always the line of Salabai to bring the students the know-how. So, yes, it's very important. So it's our duty to continue our mission, uh, which of course has proven that education remains the most Labor development, especially for the young generation. Brilliant. Well, that's great. Um, thanks so much for that overview, Claude. So let's thanks move on. Let's move on to Herman. Herman, um, tell me what's the status of the hotel industry in Phnom Penh, or if you can widen it out to the whole of Cambodia. And, and let's talk specifically about your hotel as well. It's quite uh, new. Sure. Sure, no, no problem. So what we can see in, in Cambodia is the hospitality industry in Cambodia right now is, of course, in a very dire state, right? We're on our knees. Uh, there's very limited travel coming in. Uh, yes, the borders have never closed uh, coming into Cambodia, uh, but because of the restrictions, which are rightfully there, uh, it has deterred a lot of people, may it be business, may it be leisure, 
to come into to the country, right? So this has been uh, the problem for the for the last uh, one and a half years or so. Uh, that being said, if you take a look how Cambodia has handled the pandemic and how they have handled the rollout of the vaccination program, it's been commendable, right? It's been fantastic. Uh, like you said earlier, second only to, to Singapore within Asia uh, for a developing country, which is fantastic news. So uh, hopefully in time, uh, the Cambodian government, along with the private sector, will, will reap the benefits from that, right? And we will turn the corner and hopefully we will see uh, an improvement of business or a return of business. So that would be the way forward. But right now, if you take a look, I think all of us are, are suffering heavily. We're trying to navigate the storm. Uh, a lot of us are pivoting outside of our comfort zone, trying to see what we can do to at least get some cash flow still inside the company, right? Uh, to, to keep on going. Uh, we're trying different uh, avenues to, to see what we can, we can do. Um, this has worked in some cases, in some cases it has not. Uh, but in general, very, very tough. And all we can see now is that there is light at the end of the tunnel and uh, hopefully sooner than later, let's put it that way. Yes, and I understand your hotel, the, the Hyatt Regency in Phnom Penh has recently opened. It opened in a pandemic. Tell me more yes. about that, that sounds crazy. Yes, we opened in the middle of a pandemic, correct. We opened on the 6th of January. Uh, at that time, of course, uh, we could see in Cambodia that uh, the control of the pandemic was very, very tight and uh, there was still some business opportunity here. Uh, we actually opened up very nicely in January, February, and we saw improvement of business month on month. Uh, then the pandemic did touch Cambodia in a very hard way. Uh, the country was forced uh, into lockdown. Uh, there were several measures put in place by the Cambodian government to contain the pandemic, but also to plan accordingly to, to be able to run, out, uh, run the vaccination program. Uh, so again, there we've really had to navigate the storm uh, and uh, try to catch any opportunity that we've had. Uh, it's been tough. We're still here. We'll still be here later on as well. And uh, yeah, we'll see the, the light at the end of the tunnel for sure. Well, that's great. Um, let's move on to His Excellency Tree. Um, the, the, the vaccination rollout is very impressive. Um, so how, how are you dealing with um, going forward, dealing with the, the, the private sector stakeholders, for instance, the hotel industry? Um, what, what are the next steps for you um, for opening up? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think it is a very important and critical question. And the Royal government of Cambodia, the Ministry of Tourism itself, place a lot of attention on safety and health of the public, of the people first. We have to ensure that the reopening process takes into account our safety, security, uh, in a way that we can uh, successfully contain the, the outbreak in the community and to ensure that there is no imported cases and there is no the transmission from the community to international tourists. So this is a new exercise for the world, not only for Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And when we talk specifically about Cambodia, uh, we have great success, outstanding of, of uh, vaccination. As you mentioned, we almost reach our community herd 80% is targeted. And now 60, more than 60% has been reached. So by the end of the year, we are going to have, let's say, herd community. With the recent announcement of the national campaign of uh, vaccination for uh, uh, children aged uh, 12 and so on. It is another message to restore hope. And also the announcement of the second dose to boost the immunity, the, the community immunity. I think it all combined will be a strong message and a strong uh, convincing factor to reinstill confidence and trust. Confidence and trust is 
number one to reopen, to reopen uh, international tours. That's why uh, the Ministry of Tourism has been working hard in closer collaboration with relevant authorities uh, to develop the strategic framework to uh, reopen the country with shared responsibility, placing the health and safety of people first, and to ensure that uh, 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 all the tourists visiting, coming and visit Cambodia will feel safe and safe. And, and uh, this is uh, the, the principle. So how to, con to, how to go forward? We need with the industry, of course. We need the support and engagement from hoteliers, restaurants, and the tourism operators. They are the main actor and implementers. They are in direct contact with uh, tourists. And they are also our ambassador to say something about Cambodia to uh, the international tourists. And this is very uh, important. Uh, we are going to have uh, some kind of uh, 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 the uh, customized SOP, uh, let's say about the next ATI 2022. So we need to ensure that ATI 2022 will be, will be organized in a very safe way and, con and then very, uh, you know, uh, with, with strong trust and confidence from the participants. So we are now uh, having a lot of work to complete. Uh, in collaboration with uh, the Forest Authority. Thank you. Okay, that's great. I also read somewhere that you'd be opening up to only vaccinated tourists with um, and accepting certain tourism packages from only licensed tour operators. Is that is that true? Is that correct? Uh, this is under con consideration, and uh, of course so we. Our main objective is to ensure that uh, the pilot project or to, to, to the reopening is uh, safe. So there might some, there might be some, you know, uh, approaches to to be laid out according to the situation at that time. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, the initiative and, and the, com the commitment from the government. But some COVID nineteen is unpredictable. Everyone can understand it. And so we need to be very cautious on the way. So um, you mentioned earlier confidence and trust. Um, so this is obviously a big thing to welcome tourists back to your country. But what about the flip side? And I guess this is a question for all of, all of the panelists. Um, what do the local communities want there? Are they... Um, are they welcoming to have international visitors or are they a bit wary um, to have uh, foreigners to come back to Cambodia? What's the sentiment on the ground? Well, if, if I may, if, if you take a look, for example, at the staff of, of, of the Hyatt, right? But if you take a look also at the staff of the other hotels in, in Phnom Penh and, and the people working in the restaurant industry, they want to have business, right? Uh, I think the key thing here is, is that everyone here, first of all, would like to be safe. Uh, and that's why you can see that everyone wants to get vaccinated. The majority of the people in Cambodia want to get vaccinated, which is already a very, very good sign, right? Um, being vaccinated gives them confidence, right? And I think with that, they want to see that uh, something happens with regards to business coming back. So I don't think that they are so much scared. I think they will open tourism or business back with open arms. Uh, also realize that it's a livelihood for them, right? Uh, they need this, right? We all need this. Yes. Um, so I think that they're definitely open for it. Okay, and, and what about your students? Um... Well, I think we have exactly the same uh, feeling um, Students who started to work last year and have obviously stopped working because somebody has closed for, for a while, um, they still want to restart working. So I think the, the communication, explanation, and education is paramount. Um, as soon as you explain the families, of course, because you need also to educate the families, some of 
them are very, very remote sites and they, they don't know so much about COVID or they have learned many things which are sometimes fake news or things like that. So we need to be very, very consistent in educating the family. Of course, uh, allow they, 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 they son or daughter to go back to work. So that's, that's a very crucial time for us and it's very important now because we are recruiting the next generation. We are trying to visit the family. So that's, that's one of the main explain to the, to the family. But most of our students from the, the current intake have been vaccinated, and all our staff is now vaccinated. And Tree, what about the general population in Cambodia? Because um, I guess Cambodia is very reliant on tourism, but for instance, I'm based in Japan, in Tokyo, and, and there was a, a lot of um, people against um, holding the Olympics here. You know, people were very apprehensive. What's, what's the general mood in, in Cambodia? Uh, as mentioned by Herman, Cambodian people are running for vaccination. So for them, for us, vaccination is the solution, mm -hmm. key solution. And besides that, the measure let out by the government, three times three, you know, three, three protection and three, uh, uh, you know, watch hands, something, three, three, uh, three measures. Uh, are really important uh, in addition to the individual uh, factors and uh, daily life. Uh, uh, to install or to uh, uh, restore the confidence and trust for local uh, people, especially uh, the tourism professionals uh, working in the industry. The Ministry of Tourism has also de implemented and developed the uh, guidelines for safety and health, which is in complementarity to what the Ministry of Health and WHO, the Royal Government of Cambodia. So has been implemented. So it, there, there is such, such kind of cooperation from uh, people, local people. Our leaders, uh, our prime minister, a very strong commitment, very straightforward uh, measure, very effective uh, commitment and uh, command. So, and uh, that's why, uh, and the people with uh, the commitment from individual to comply with uh, what the government has been uh, put has been putting out as measures, uh, we, 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 how we, we can see a very confidence from the people, very uh, you know the, the, the strong trust from the people on the leaders for the leaders of the country. This is uh, the the man the, the man force. We we are very united. We are we place our hope on the government. Mm -hmm. This is uh, important. And for your remark, for your information, within ASEAN, we also developed the ASEAN guidelines for hygiene and uh, safety. Uh, now we, Cambodia is a big country uh, in collaboration with active ASEAN ministers, have also uh, you know, uh, develop, uh, developed these uh, guidelines and will be endorsed by the end of the year. And then this guideline will be uh, basic for the reopening of the region and the reopening of individual country. Uh, it is applicable to all. Great. Um, so just a quick reminder to all the audience, if you would like to ask a, a question to any of our panelists, please use the Q&A function on the bottom right of the screen. Um, so, but going forward, I think Claude and Herman have both um, used this word, diversification. They to diversify their, their business plans, so to speak. Um, uh, His Excellency Tree, what about uh, the tourism offerings? Have you had to diversify? Are you looking more at adventure travel, I heard? Is, is that correct? We, we, we... Uh, the, we have uh, the diversification uh, strategies since a long time. 
And now we can, we, we can see more and more importance to do so uh, with the trends of the world tourism post pandemic, post pandemic. Uh, uh, we, we are now developing new products, of course, and our future offering will be focusing on uh, uh, coastal area, of course, and uh, ecotourism, community-based tourism, and uh, cultural heritage. Uh, of course, uh, the, we, we can see the UNWTO also forecast that the next uh, the post pandemic uh, behavior of uh, tourists, which are uh, more likely uh, to work coastal area, uh, eco tourism, cultural heritage. So, uh, uh, saying this, I, uh, you know, city tourism is still uh, on the uh, increasing demand. Great. So um, Phnom Penh, Herman, um, city tourism is, is on, is still in big demand. Herman, you were mentioning your hotel had to diversify. What have you had to do? Are you doing takeaway? Um, what, how's the hotel industry um, diversified well, in Cambodia? Well, takeaway, like you said, that's, uh, well, that's one thing that we've uh, looked into and that we're doing actually, right? So it's, it's not diversifying and pivoting basically right it is uh, extending your offering uh, so of course uh, most hotels like us we have restaurants already on site right uh, but because of uh, certain curfews because of certain restrictions that were enforced right uh, we've had to look into uh, delivery takeaway uh, colleague hotels around the region have also done a drive-through food trucks Right. So we've had to take a look at a very different offering. Right. And we've also had to take a look at other revenue streams where, for example, not very traditional revenue streams, uh, laundry service, for example. Normally, laundry services is, is it's a small part of the revenue stream of a hotel, but not its main priority. Right. But at the end of the day, if you have nothing else to go on, you take a look at your laundry uh, service. Every cent helps. Right. So. We've uh, had a look at our laundry services and offered that to the local public here. Uh, so that's something else that we've looked at. So we've had to uh, be creative in our solutions and find new ways on how to uh, gain uh, audience and to, to drive business basically wherever we can. I can imagine it. It's a very challenging time. For sure, challenging and very interesting. Um, and Claude, I liked the idea that you diversified into organic farming. Um, that, that's it's really um, going forward, isn't it? I think people well, want that sort of um, organic, local, locally produced experience. Well, I think it's very important to educate also the students who are cultivating their own vegetable and fruit. I mean, it's really connected, to be honest with you beverage. So we, we plan to supply our training restaurant and also our student canteen. Which, uh, which all the so, uh, of course, the, the hotel and, and restaurant are closed for the moment. Um, and also, we, we have uh, started to diversify our internship when it was still open in company with some from, from students in company. Because CMRF has to close a little bit earlier because, of course, the drop down of Massive at the very beginning, which was not the case in, in terms of So we have to be very flexible also for internship. Now it's holidays for the students. Uh, we, we expect to restart again, uh, I hope, uh, in September. So we've got a, a question for you, Claude, from Mary Mendoza. Um, how is Sal Salabai sustaining its initiatives now that there's no travel, well, travel has come to almost a halt. Um, is Salabai a non profit? And I guess it, it also it can't have been, it must have been really difficult and expensive also to get um, yeah. video equipment. That, that's a very good, yeah, that's a very good question because we have also to change and to be more flexible on our funding aspects. Um, you have to know that the restaurant and the hotel provide 30% of our. Uh, income, uh, 
Uh, so all of these are diversified at disappear. Basically. So uh, obviously we have to diversify our funding, uh, our funding uh, funders. And uh, we work closely with many uh, networks. Uh, we have uh, a network in Australia, also in Singapore, where Liz or Sierra knows well, and such Salabai, which is a very good network, support also the students in the same way. And of course from Paris, from France, we, we diversify our funding uh, through uh, foundations, through uh, uh, events, then we can do also all of us all of the works and uh, then we have to find new new uh, source of revenue to cover to cover the cost because we didn't cut into salaries. We keep all the students. We uh, also launch uh, emergency relief plans for the for the alumni, so that costs a lot of money. And we have to work on that hardly from uh, from Paris and also from our network of ambassadors. Well, that's great. I think it's a fantastic initiative because a lot of your uh, graduates will be the, the main income earner for their families. Exactly. Uh, we expect, I mean, one student support uh, between four and five members or siblings within the family. So, and some of them, they support their siblings and some uh, uh, siblings can go back to school thanks to the Salabai students because they just want to go back to school. So it's a very... It's, it's a really a, a very efficient development project. More than just a notal school, it's also a, a development project. Great. Um, we've got some more questions here. We've got, uh, excuse my pronunciation if I get your name wrong, I apologize in advance. So Trilok uh, Narain. Um, so I guess this is for uh, Tree. Is, the Ministry of Tourism bring any waivers to setting up a TA business in, in the coming year? And, um, and what about airline connectivity? Is there um, plans for reopening in the last quarter of this, of this year? Yes, for this matter, uh, it is in the package of uh, initiatives under the development of strategy framework to reopen, uh, to reopen the, the country. So far, the, the government of Cambodia supported tourism business and other uh, sectors. Uh, so we, our tourism business also benefited from, uh, from the incentives policy, from the public package. So I cannot to name, uh, you know, Specifically, right now, because the wide range of uh, incentives. The next, uh, I would say, uh, to uh, put it in the strategy framework, and the strategy framework to reopen the country will be uh, consulted with relevant ministers. Okay, wonderful. Just one last question from Zuliana Jamler. Um, and this is a question for Herman. Um, has your has the hotel been involved in the quarantine process? Uh, no, the hotels, all hotels have uh, not been involved in the quarantine process as such, right? There are hotels that are selected as quarantine hotels, but all the hotels will have to work closely with the different ministries, right? To make sure that uh, we comply, right? And to get on any quarantine hotel list or things like that, it is a collaboration between the hotel uh, association and the ministry. So there are hotels that have chosen to become quarantine hotels. There are others who were already on the list from the start. There are others that want to go on it, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's more a collaboration than direct involvement. Right. Okay, great. Well, I think we've run out of time. I'm really sorry. We, we, I could keep going for, for another 10 minutes at least. Um, it's, it's really interesting to hear from everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, to all the panelists for your time. Um, good luck, Cambodia, with your uh, vaccination rollout. You're almost there. So I really look forward to, to coming back to Cambodia and and thank you everyone today for your, for your insights. It's been wonderful to hear from you. So thank you again, and let's head back to Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Claude. Uh, Excellent C3 and Herman. And of course, thank you so much, Carmen. It's always uh, great to have you with us. You always do an excellent job and, and stay safe in, in, in Tokyo and stay safe, uh, all of you. So thank you so much for, for joining us. You guys can now turn off cameras now. Um, but I will mention this. There are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, I think Herman, I think they're actually for Herman and Tree. Uh, while I do my wrap up, you guys can take some time. You actually can type your answers to those questions uh, if you wish. Uh, just go into the Q&A, uh, Herman and Tree. Just feel free to type a response if you wish. Um, and while I do a quick wrap up, again, thank you to our good friends and partners at the BBC, as well as our, our good friends at the Ministry of Tourism Cambodia. Uh, I do hope to see them and, of course, all of you at the ASEAN Tourism Forum next year in Chinookville. Um, it's hopefully, you know, it it's probably will be our first uh overseas travel um, if things don't uh, open up sooner. But, uh, you know, I do look forward to that. Always good to reconnect with old friends and meet new ones. So I said, I'll do just a quick wrap up here as uh, as we end this uh, session. Now, um, just wanted to, to uh, get you aware of some of our uh, webinar, upcoming webinars and events that are happening. Um, so, you know, the, the, our, next two, our next webinar, this is actually is uh, for members only or uh, our PADA youth members. So if you're, if you're a PADA member, uh, feel free to join us. Uh, this is on August 11th at 3 p.m. This is with our good friends at MasterCard and they're looking at 2021 travel trends and outlook. Um, and we'll be joined by uh, Mr. Andreas Speicher and Mr. David Mann. So, uh, Please feel free to register for that event. This again is for PADA members uh, only. So um, if you're not a member, uh, maybe you should sign up now and be able to, to be able to take uh, advantage of all the exclusive content that we'll be providing over the coming weeks. Uh, our next uh, webinar after that, again, this is for PADA members only. Um, this is part of our PADA innovation series, uh, top PR and marketing tips for small hotels. And this is with Ms. Linda Williams, the founder and managing director of Vim and Vigor. This is on August 19th at 3 p.m. Bangkok time. Uh, and in September, of course, we will have our Pot of Travel Mart, of course, with things the way they are. This is virtual. This is in conjunction with the Sichuan International Travel Expo and our featured destination is Lushan, China. And thank you very much to uh, Lushan government for help supporting this event. This event is from the September 2nd to the 5th. Booth, if you're a PADA member, booth is a complimentary, so you can get a take advantage of a free booth. Uh, if you're not a member, you can um, actually you can actually can pay for a booth. If you're a buyer, you can sign up today. Um, said it's September 2nd to the 5th. Um, they, it will be, of course, your, your trades, your, the trade show, some, some appointments, but also we'll have other content and games and giveaways during the, the three days of the events. Um, and we also uh, I don't have a slide here, but I wanted to admit, uh, we will be announcing soon another event at the um, later in the year. This will be our virtual pot of travel marts, um, and this will be focusing on luxury and wellness. More information to come in the coming days, so please do keep a lookout for that. As I said, you know the, the benefits of being a pot of member, you get access to some of our exclusive content, the webinars I just said. You can get a free booth for pot of travel marts, so if you're not a member, uh, join today. Um, for more information, feel free to contact me. My email is right there, paul at pata.org. If, um, if you have more information about if any of our events, our webinars, our benefits, our research that, that John had mentioned or any other research, check out our website at www.pata.org. Um, this webinar is, will, is uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you missed any part of it, feel free to go to our YouTube channel. A lot of our other webinars are there. So feel free to browse that if you like what you see. I sound like a YouTuber when I say that, but like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Uh, There's a lot of great content. You know, I think Liz had mentioned our Crisis Resource Center. There's a lot of content that's open for everybody, so feel free to take advantage of that. Um, so once again, thank you to the BBC and the Ministry of Tourism of Cambodia um, for helping us organize this. Uh, thank you to our speakers. And of course, thank you to all of our members, our chapter members, our life members, our partners. Without your continued support, uh, none of this would be possible. 
And last but not least, thank you to all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Please keep a lookout for our next Destination Insights series. We'll, um, of course, uh, if, you, if you want to stay updated, go to our website or subscribe to our newsletter and you'll find out when that might be. Uh, or actually, you can also uh, go out to our social media, our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. And with that, that is the end of today's session. Thank you so much. And I will see you uh, next time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. Bye. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Bye, Tree.